And so our next speaker is back on the question of environmental law. As a matter of fact, Professor Bill Rogers, may I call you Bill? Bill Rogers is actually the person who wrote the law, as far as I'm concerned, on environmental law. This is Mr. Environmental Law. Uh, and as I've said earlier today, I'm not going to go through everybody's CV. This one would kind of blow you away uh, if I were to speak it to you. I will say this, that I actually was a student of yours when you were over in Georgetown, and you don't remember that because at that time I looked more radical than I really was. But now that I don't look radical, I'm there. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, is I became a civil and a commercial litigator because I didn't listen that closely to what my professor was telling me back then. And had I listened more closely, I would have been like Stephen Tan and become an environmental litigator, which is what I should have become. So without more, I'm giving you a speaker who is actually uh, completing, has completed a six-year term as a member of the Board of Environmental Studies and Toxicology with the National Academy of Sciences, the person, the prof who wrote the book on environmental law and is expert in the area of Indian law and has argued Indian law issues before the US Supreme Court and every other court that matters, Professor Rogers. Hi. Nice to be here. Uh, you see, the way Commons works is the first guy into the room gets the biggest piece. We all learn that in, in uh, teaching because typically the prof who precedes you does not erase the blackboard, and that's a spillover cost that you have once, not once, but all, every meeting of the quarter. And you do not engage in reciprocity until next quarter. And you can only do that through scheduling. Now, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, for those of you who don't read uh, Wikipedia but hang out with science magazines, I do want to give you a little background on uh, the physical environmental issue of the times. And this is climate change. And much of what I've heard today uh, forgets about the fact that the world is changing dramatically in a physical way. Um, this is the huge justice issue of the future. Uh, this is the gigantic commons issue of the future. Our past experience is not close to resolving it. We're solving it the same way that uh, prior speaker mentioned about one of the problems uh, he adverted to. We're solving it by ignoring it. Uh, it's going to creep up on us, and it will have enormous effects. Now, I haven't, uh, I'm going to give you first a few slides on this particular problem. Bill Calvin is a local Seattle guy expert on the brain, really a wonderful writer, and uh, world's expert on uh, Kanzi, the most intelligent bonobo ever to walk the face of the earth. Kanzi is uh, the Einstein that was discovered among the, the bonobos. Um, and in his second life, Calvin is a reviewer for the work of the IPCC. He's a very serious scientist and quite underspoken. And here's his uh, assessment you've had a chance to read of the future that awaits us about 2050. So for the young people, certainly within your expected lifespans. When you read all the contemporary material, and I'm not here to make this argument, I just want you to see what's being said about it. Had into class the other day David Battisti, who's one of the climate experts at the University of Washington. David organized the scientists in Massachusetts v. EPA, so he actually worked on the amicus brief. He read the opinions of the U.S. Court of Appeals for District of Columbia in Massachusetts v. EPA, and he was aghast at how the courts could misrepresent and misunderstand the science. 
He was sure that at least the courts can get it right, but not so. He's most concerned not about sea level rise, which is a very significant issue, but primarily the loss of rain, the drying out of the earth, and the loss of the ability to produce food supplies. So he's quite confident that we're on the road to a worldwide famine. And the fact that we're doing nothing about it will mean we'll be stuck with geoengineering. And that is not a, a happy or optimistic future. So just a few excerpts from those ideas. This is another just published study. The expected outcome for the Amazon is not being piecemealed and cut up into small pieces that, that we've been reading about for the last few years. The Hadley centers, uh, they did their modeling on that. And the basic expectation is it will dry out and then it will burn down and then it will be gone. Jim Lovelock is an interesting guy, 90 years old. He's the inventor of the Gaia hypothesis. Going into space next year. He's an atmospheric chemist. Very candid. And when he talks about the fool's climate, what he's talking about is the negative forcing element, they call it, in the climate change scheme that is if we keep our low-level air pollution at appropriate rates, we'll have a cooling phenomenon. One of the experts on that topic is also at the University of Washington, Bob Charlson, his name is. And in fact, some of the geoengineering schemes rest on this notion. The idea is we can fire into space through cannons, uh, small particulates, and this will be able to keep us cool just at the point when we are becoming desperately hot. We just have to keep that going for about a thousand years. It would be a good contract, a defense contract. Uh, I'm sure they're looking into it at this point. Basically, um, so Lovelock is pretty candid with his comments. And I'll skip over some of these. They're very concerned about the tipping points. And while I mention law, um, let me address this factor. One of the leading scientists in the world on climate change is Jim Hansen. He testified in a case uh, in 2007, and he was going to explain the phenomena of the tipping point. And the defense, largely the auto industry in that case, made a motion to strike his testimony. It's a Daubert motion, we call it. Um, you know, that's amazing. That's like making a Daubert motion aimed at Einstein, and you're arguing there's no empirical data for his wild speculations. Um, fortunately, they lost that motion, but I think, as Lou Wolcher would remind you, um, they were just one decision away from not losing that motion. So this is an information, we talk about free information available at the drop of a hat. This has not been true with respect to climate change. And the information uh, world has been complete cover-up, complete denial, uh, so much so in the Kivalina case filed uh, just last year, some of the tobacco lawyers trying to get compensation for one of the soon-to-be flooded Alaska villages charged uh, Exxon major coal industry with conspiracy to retard the publication, promotion, and understanding and realization of information on climate change, a cover-up in a sense. But in the bigger world of law, and all the law students know this, lawyers want to control their information. You hire your own experts. If you get your expert at the far end of the spectrum. If you can't get an expert, if you can control all experts by producing the science in wholesale, you do that. 
this is, uh, this is the way the system works. And if the IPCC is giving bad information, then you attack the IPCC. This is the International Panel on Climate Change that's been working on this issue for about 15 years. And Lovelock says, much too late for sustainable development. I'm going to walk you through a few slides on basically a peek into the future. Here's a study in Nature 2005, estimating that we're about ready to lose 60% of the species on Earth. Tom Lovejoy is a great biologist, uh, served on a number of committees, the National Academy of Sciences. This is Tom talking about the declining reefs that are disappearing because of the acidification of the sea. See, the CO2 either stays in the atmosphere, it goes in the earth, it goes in the sea. And there are limits to the extent to which the earth and the sea can consume this new commodity. Calvin again. on the oceans, some of the worst case projections. Susan Solomon is a great researcher at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We've already made the commitment, having this in the pipeline, it stays in the pipeline for many, many years. And we've basically gone too far too fast. And this is some of the reaction. Good news, by the way, this is a tongue in cheek. Bob Trivers, a friend of mine, and he's a very radical guy. He's, uh, he's an evolutionary biologist, and um, he's a white guy who spent a lot of time with the Black Panthers. And one of his buddies is uh, Huey Newton. But anyhow, this is Trivers on good news. The good news is that there was currently no chance that we could extinguish all of life. The bacterial slimosphere alone extends some 10 miles into the earth, and yet we can make life truly miserable only for the vast majority of people, not extinguish human life entirely. I would expect this state of affairs to continue indefinitely. The feeling that everything may be fine if only we survive the next 50 to 500 years may become a regular part of our psychology. <laughs> so that's the good news. Now, they, they describe this as the perfect problem. And this is why most of the theory about overcoming the tragedy of the commons is so completely wrong. We, it is pathetically small. And this summarizes some of the difficulties uh, that we face with these huge, uh, and the huge lag time, the multiple players, the dozens of reasons to defect. Um, the idea of organizing the world into combating global warming gases is, uh, is just very, very difficult. Plus, by the way, we, we heard earlier about uh, the importance of learning. You gotta know, and we've learned this in the natural resources world, some people don't wanna learn. And this, therefore, is a resolution of the Cattlemen's Meeting, West Texas, 1898, resolved that none of us know or care to know anything about grasses, native or otherwise. Outside the fact that for the present there are lots of them, the best on record, and we were after getting the most out of them while they last. There's an investment in ignorance. Here's a comment on the Johns Manville Corporation, and I offer this to the students. This is basically the way I think about corporations. When the Johns Mansville Corporation covered up the lethal effects of asbestos, the company sent to their unknowing desk not strangers, but hundreds of their employees. Any reptile would have done the same. That's what we're dealing with. These entities that we put personality behind and belief uh, are fictional entities, and we explain to our students how reptilian behavior is uh, perfectly acceptable with respect to corporations. 
Here's another excellent book I want to refer you to. Mistakes were made, but not by me. Uh, again, this is an exploration of the human brain and its tendencies and um, why we don't see problems of a certain nature and why we have difficulty organizing and why we remember things that are not so. Here's Tony Scalia when the public learned that Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia was flying to Louisiana on a government plane to go duck hunting with Vice President Dick Cheney, despite Cheney's having a pending case before the Supreme Court. There was a flurry of protests at Scalia's apparent conflict of interest. Scalia himself was indignant at the suggestion that his ability to assess the constitutionality of Cheney's claim that the Vice President was legally entitled to keep the details of his energy task force secret would be tainted by the ducks and the perks. In a letter to the Los Angeles Times explaining why he would not recuse himself, Scalia wrote, I do not think my impartiality could reasonably be questioned. And that's true today. I guess it was predictable that he would decide in favor of the vice president. And he did. So no one is offended. And we still don't know the names of the people who served on the vice president's energy committee. You no, know, with Saul the Commons, Eleanor Ostrom is a leading researcher, and her work is very well known. There are examples of successful resolution of conflicts in the Commons, Maine lobsters, Columbia River salmon. The system can be made to work. There are some beautiful cases, and these are sustainable activities extending over centuries. Here's Buzz Thompson giving you the specifics of what you need for the Eleanor Ostrom factors to work. And what I want to leave with the students is the recognition of how restrictive these conditions are. They cannot possibly be met for a wide variety of problems and for the most prominent justice problem of all, which is the problem of climate change. Sure. Convince all resource users that a problem exists. Hey, the New York Times had an article just last week, 500 people gathering to deny the existence of climate change. One of them was Harrison Schmidt, former astronaut, geologist, commonly known as Rockhead. I actually had a, actually had a personal run-in with this guy years ago. Some, one of his employees published a study, Energy Conservation Alternative to Nuclear Power. There were 30,000 copies produced within NASA, but old Rockhead grabbed onto all 30,000. They got rid of this guy. Hey, there, this is the nature of life. You know, there is disagreement. Some people insist upon disagreement. Some people will insist upon disagreement. They don't want to hear the facts. Remember the cattlemen. So you're not going to be offended about it. Let me talk about sustainability. Uh, that's our idea. You know, can we at least keep a climate going? We haven't been able to handle uh, the Amazon or Lake Victoria or the Columbia River. We all we, we simply reduce them to another factor in the economic machine. But how about the climate? And when you look at the researchers, they have lots of ambitions about what should be maintained. And of course, their knowledge is there. Um, uh, cultural findings are there, uh, political enterprises we wish to maintain over time, but always within that frame there's a, there's a huge desire to maintain the physical world that we know supports us and gives us what everyone needs and remembers. Uh, so there are the collection of the articles on sustainability, what the academics wish to sustain. Nanotechnology, Java forests, indigenous peoples in the Amazon, financial vibrancy, Singapore, stakeholders, healthcare, biomass energy, green buildings, the Pacific Rim, South Africa, air carriers, coffee, biofuels, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, things that we want to keep going. Now the problem is sustainability is a vague term. And here's a, another 
comment from an optimist. The Roch word is sustainability. In plain English, that means making a profit so that more profit-seeking investors will enter and enlarge the market. Environmentalists lost that one very quickly. Now, a lesson. I've studied the sustainability, Columbia River. Do you know when the fish were at their high point in the river? You're thinking, well, Grand Coulee came in in 41 and Bonneville in 36. Maybe they were okay post-World War II, then all the fishing gear picked up. Uh, no, nope. correct answer is 1883. And basically, the fisheries were in very difficult straits in 1883. The first lawsuit was filed in 1884. Natives went to the Supreme Court seven times. They won seven times in the US Supreme Court. They basically were able to maintain a sustainable fishery over those years. That picture is a picture of, from uh, the fishing platforms at Salilo, and they had a company rule that if somebody went overboard, you'd drop your nets, nets in. And if it was a happy afternoon, you'd come out with uh, somebody who went overboard. And that's what happened in this picture. So a nine-year-old kid falls in upstream to a certain death. But because this is a cooperative venture, all the nets go in, and he's pulled out downstream to his great happiness. That's a good story. And they maintained that for hundreds of years. Now, you'll never see a fish like this one again. That's a, it's a white sturgeon. We didn't do this with a computer arrangement of some kind. That, uh, that's a real fish. Same with that one. That guy, Henry Charlie, was one of the litigators in the Columbia River. That's a very big fish. I'd love to see those again, but we won't. There is change in this sustainability idea. And I have, I don't know, maybe it's the radical in me. I sort of love this. These wobblies, the Columbia River, these are the guys who are ruining the fisheries. But you gotta like their gumption. This is their uh, admissions list. No liquor dealer, gambler, politician, capitalist, lawyer, agent for capitalists, no persons holding office, whether under a national, state, or municipal government, shall under any consideration become members. Beautiful. I love them. They're gone. Okay, things change. But we didn't sustain the Columbia River Fishermen's Protective Union. That's... Uh, that's a will of the old Indian Samson Tooley who's leaving his t fishing places to his children for all times. The only future he anticipated was a future on the river where you'd go fishing. They call it a fee tail in property as they smirk. Ah, we don't do this anymore. I guess we don't. Too bad. You know, the World Commission on Development invented the idea of sustainable development. This was the way that maybe we could have it both ways. Economic development, we're going to save our physical world. It's invented in 1987. Here's a graphic on how well we're doing. This is what's happening in the physical world. This is the measure of why climate change is a very serious issue. This little graphic was done by uh, Anna Moritz as a 3L at the University of Wa uh, Washington, a student of mine. And you'll see basically all those lines going up are going straight to disaster. You know, they, they cannot continue to grow. This is the, these are the drivers that are taking away our climate. And as they proceed along those lines, how are we doing in fighting back? And the best comment that I know of is found in a book by Gus Speth. And his, I won't share it with you, but his basic notion is that our rule of law in the international regime does not work. So as he says, the Climate Convention is not protecting climate. The Biodiversity Convention is not protecting biodiversity. The Desertif Desertification Convention is not preventing desertification. And even the older and stronger Convention of the Law of the Sea is not protecting fisheries. So this is a legal failure, among other things. We have lots of excuses, but at the bottom, it's a legal failure. And Lovelock says, too late for sustainable development. This is why it doesn't work. 
I like that phrase. We're no more qualified to be the stewards and developers of the earth than our goats to be gardeners. We've got a lot of goats around. Now, how uh, I can wrap this up and tend to in a minute, uh, lots of negative stuff, especially for the students, right? Nothing works. Laws of farce. Uh, the Orrin Hatch has been in charge of appointments to the federal courts for 30 years. This is terrible. Uh, we are really doomed. The Supreme Court is uh, embarrassingly short. What are we going to do? Well, the key here, in addition to all those problems with self-deception and inability to read reality, and stubbornness and desire to pursue stupidity, you have another great trait. Um, and it's called unwarranted optimism. <laughs> and you can see it makes a lot of Darwinian sense. You know, if you're going to put this little primate out there with no fangs and no claws, they got to have a venturing and happy an optimistic spirit to get things done. So this is good news. And uh, so I've got a few positive self-deceptions, what we want to do here. And we then describe proper cognitive stance. What they mean is just the right amount of weirdness. So you have to go into this world with, I think I can, and by the way, on the legal front of climate change, I'd take all the rest of the time to tell you what's going on. Everybody, everywhere is trying everything. It is a really exciting time. On the international front, and Lou Wolcher has a, has a course on international human rights this quarter at the, at the university. Uh, a whole set of theories that are being brought to bear on this. People are asking if you actually flood out a nation and make them walk away. You know, is that like a form of aggression forbidden on the, on the UN Charter? Uh, I mean, because you're not supposed to take over somebody else's territory. I mean, every possible theory that you could imagine is being, uh, is being worked out. NEPA, NEPA is just awesome at this point, killing them with NEPA. So uh, as I conclude, I want to conclude with this little reference about the advantages of self-deception. And everybody remembers that book about the civil action. The book is actually, to me, a little bit better than the movie. But you remember the reality was uh, they were bluffing. They were using their credit cards, remember, to finance the litigation. They were faking it day to day, trying to last. Um, they were being ground under and outlasted. And they had to hang in there, fake it, imagine they could do better. And eventually it, waked out, it worked out for them. And, and I think this captures what the idea that I want to leave with you. To negotiate a settlement, they had to be prepared to go ahead with a trial. Grace had to believe they were willing to go ahead. And for Grace to believe that, they had to make themselves believe it too. So there is this positive side to self-deception. And you can take on the giant only by believing that you can slay the giant. Uh, so this is, uh, this is why a lot of us uh, work on these things. You have a wonderful topic. Remember, this issue of the commons been solved in some contexts. So we can look to those contexts with respect to natural resources, not for all times, but for long times. And uh, the, the good news is you really got a problem ahead of you. We've seen nothing like it. Just awesome. Congratulations. Be graduating at such a time. So thank you.